Uh, welcome to this uh, second lecture on uh, topology and condensed matter physics course. Um, I'll uh, sort of the, the last lecture was an introduction uh, to topology in general physics and in which uh, we have given an example of uh, uh, the Dirac monopole which is uh, you know seen as a singularity and uh, in the same spirit we have talked about Aronoff Baum effect uh, where you know uh, sort of uh, winding or rather going around that um, singularity which is uh, the cylinder uh, uh, the, that's a solenoid that gives rise to the winding and this uh, has to be in integer times uh, 2 pi. Um, we'll carry on the same discussion. However, we'll uh, now try to uh, shift towards uh, the condensed matter physics and how uh, various things uh, that are uh, borrowed from this topology and homotopy theory, etc. They are applied to uh, branches of condensed matter physics. Uh, different studies of materials and some of the uh, experiments that are known to us to show topological invariant. So, uh, we start with this uh, statement that its uh, topology is a branch of mathematics. Uh, it is uh, concerned with the special properties uh, preserved under continuous deformation. Uh, that is, you are not allowed to do any stretching or tearing or puncturing of the object and um, these properties which remain unchanged are called as a topological invariant. Um, for example, you see that um, uh, there is a coffee mug that is uh, continuously being deformed into the shape of a donut and uh, the handle of the coffee mug where you hold the cup is the one that is forming the hole inside the donut. And um, uh, this is uh, it is a particular uh, you know example that we are deforming uh, an object and it is going into another object completely different, but uh, they are uh, topologically equivalent that is uh, one is being continuously deformed into another uh, without puncturing or tearing or breaking uh, that thing. Okay. Apparently, this has got nothing to do with condensed matter physics, but however, we will show that this has uh, very deep implications uh, on the condensed matter physics that we study in modern times. And um, the whole thing was uh, you know uh, put into perspective, uh, these studies are put into perspective uh, since the discovery of the quantum Hall effect uh, uh, that is in 1980 and has been uh, the focus since then. And especially with this 2016 Nobel Prize uh, that we have said earlier uh, to Holden, Costleys, and Thaulis, uh, this uh, study has become much more prominent uh, and its applications to the condensed matter community has become uh, in focus for quite some time now. Uh, so, these, uh, these topological invariants, which is just a hole here called the genus, as we will see in the next uh, slides. Uh, there are these uh, similar to this in condensed matter physics, we will be talking about topological uh, invariants um, which will be measurable uh, or rather can be computed from the uh, bulk properties of the material and these are called as a winding number, uh, the churn number and the Z2 invariant and so on. Okay? Uh, there are a whole lot of classification of this and that is uh, what we are uh, you know, going to study. Okay, so, it is the same picture I am showing uh, once again uh, that uh, so that you see uh, the snapshots of various uh, phases of this. So, uh, if you look at the left picture which starts with a cup, a white cup and then it slowly gets uh, you know deformed and then uh, forms a donut pretty much uh, what you see on the right. So, uh, we will have to deform a certain system and when we say a certain system what we actually mean is that the Hamiltonian of the system will be deformed uh, that is with respect to change in certain parameter and um, uh, if uh, it can be smoothly deformed then uh, and, and gives rise to an invariant that is that remains unchanged through this process then it is uh, uh, topological uh, system or uh, the Hamiltonian denotes a topological system and um, if you need to you know uh, puncture it or tear it then of course, uh, you are not uh, uh, getting back the same system and uh, 
in terms of the hamiltonian this means that uh, you know the, some of the energy levels that are actually crossing the fermi energy and uh, which is equivalent to uh, puncturing or tearing of the object uh, so you have to uh, maintain the number of uh, levels below the fermi energy and of course above the fermi energy to be uh, same and um, if uh, uh, by virtue of this variation of the parameter if uh, this number that is the number of energy levels below the Fermi energy remains same uh, and then uh, the system actually is uh, topologically uh, <coughs> and there is a gap then the uh, system is topologically non-trivial. So, uh, just to uh, give you an idea of winding number we will uh, talk about them more uh, you know in a detailed manner uh, when we talk about this tight binding models, but just to give you an idea about uh, you know uh, sort of in a layman's term you see that uh, this is uh, uh, going around and this person there is a person at the middle who is looking at it and uh, this is going around the person. Uh, so, uh, if it goes around once uh, it is called as a winding number 1, if it does twice with respect to the center of this the 3 vertical pictures that you see then the winding number is 2 and similarly um, if it does it in the opposite sense that is the direction of winding is also important and uh, then the winding number is minus 2 and so on. So, as soon as the winding number is non-zero that is a, um, a particle winds a point or a singularity. Uh, so, if it is a non-trivial system uh, then it should be accompanied by a winding number which is a finite or non-zero and uh, if the winding number is 0 which means that it does not enclose the origin or the point or the person here okay, or the singularity that we have and that is why um, it will be called as a topologically trivial uh, system. So, these are uh, some shapes uh, from uh, school you know coloring books that have uh, taken and of course, uh, it is a circle which is uh, you all know circles and triangles 3 sides. Uh, square, rectangle, uh, rhombus, uh, all these other things pentagon, hexagon, etcetera, etcetera, octagon, there is a rhombus here, trapezium and so on. Okay. Now, uh, of course, they are geometrically different objects, they have no relation with one another and a child would be easily able to distinguish uh, between one shape to another. And uh, however, topologically uh, these all these are same because we would view them as closed figures okay. and uh, because all of them are closed figures all of them are topologically equivalent okay. there is no distinction between any of them. Now, that tells you that uh, even if uh, things are geometrically different that is shapes are geometrically different uh, topologically they may not be different they are in fact identical or same as is the case here. So, uh, the even though the geometry and topology uh, they are related, but of course, they are not same ok. And this is what I just wanted to emphasize from this slide ok. So, uh, let us uh, come to this topological invariance and um, this uh, taken from Joel Moore's slides uh, and in which you see that there are 3 figures uh, which are uh, one of them is uh, this one and uh, there is another one here and another one here uh, which is. Uh, so, there is a cylinder and then there is a you know a sphere and then there is something which um, is uh, looks like uh, two cones which are joined uh, with uh, you know uh, sort of uh, a surface area at the at the point of joining uh, there. So, uh, what is uh, different between the two is that this has a curvature uh, the radii of curvature or radius of curvature which uh, we want to sort of you know uh, understand that they are uh, different at different points. So, the uh, radii of curvature uh, with respect to that uh, which is written here. Uh, so, with respect to that this is negative this is 0 and this is positive ok. So, it is important that we understand this radii of curvature which is basically the curvature at the we are talking about at the equator that is at the uh, you know the middle point like here ok or here. 
so this is what we are uh, trying to say that these radii or curvatures are, uh, are different here. They are of course uh, different geometric quantities, but um, if you are asked to calculate uh, the integral of this radii of curvature over the entire surface area, that is usually a difficult problem. Um, in the sense that these are very regular objects, but uh, in, in fact you can just see that it is uh, uh, you know if you if you try to calculate the radii of curvature and then for a sphere it, it sort of comes out as 4 pi. Um, but uh, if it is a complicated object uh, you know with a lot of so different curvature along its surface then it is not such an easy uh, task to do. However, this theorem called as the Gauss bonnet theorem gives you an answer to this where uh, the sky is actually the uh, radius of curvature and A is the surface area. So, it tells you that uh, the radius of curvature when it is integrated over the entire surface area uh, of the object, the object is say M it gives you a constant which is 2 pi chi which is this chi is called it has a name called as a Poincare curvature. Um, in any case this is equal to 2 pi into 2 minus 2 g and very importantly we will take this part of the equation uh, which is very important for us and this g is called as the genus which counts the number of holes and uh, talking about the holes we have already seen here that we are talking about really the hole that uh, is there in the system. So, here it has a genus equal to 1. Okay. So, both the mug and the donut have one genus equal to 1 and you can clearly see that uh, the hole in the donut that corresponds to the, the genus and uh, where you actually hold a cup or a mug uh, that place where you hold is the the genus and this has one genus uh, or rather genus equal to 1 and uh, this is exactly that genus. Okay? So, it, it can be very easily uh, you know um, verified because uh, for a sphere uh, there is no genus, uh, the genus is 0. So, if the second term is 0 the integral is equal to 4 pi and which is a known result which you all know. Okay? So, this uh, theorem uh, is uh, really connected intimately to the studies of condensed matter physics and uh, we will show you over a period of time or rather as the course uh, you know proceeds that how it is connected. We will give you a preliminary idea today, but then it will be explored throughout the course uh, this particular theorem and its relevance to condensed matter physics. Okay. And uh, so, this is uh, I mean whatever may be the shape of this uh, object that you consider and then if you take um, the radii of curvature, radius of curvature and then integrate over the entire surface area this gives you a constant and this constant contains a quantity called as genus which just counts the number of holes. So, it counts holes of the object. All right. So, uh, this is as I said that will be discussed along with the uh, real condensed matter systems. Okay. I give you examples that uh, this has uh, genus equal to 0, it is just an orange, there is a, a saucer uh, or a plate and then you see that uh, these are uh, genus equal to 1. So, as I said that it just counts the number of it is equal to the number of holes, this is equal to 1 and so on. And so, the genus of a particular object or a surface. Okay. Uh, this is called as a Mobius strip. Okay. You can easily make it the only thing that is important about this Mobius strip is that it is uh, joined in such a manner that if uh, an ant starts crawling from here, it goes through the full ribbon, it will find itself on the other side of the ribbon. Okay? And uh, you can see this if you trace this path, one can understand that you come to the other surface of this ribbon. and um, so. It has to 
undergo two such revolutions uh, or two such trips it has to make in order to come back to the same surface okay and uh, so this is like that winding that we are talking about uh, so this this really corresponds to winding the strip or rather moving uh, you know in the uh, on the surface of the strip twice in order to come back to the uh, same surface okay this is exactly uh, shown there so it is a uh, sort of a cartoon in which there is a twist that is there and if you look at the red dot or the red ball uh, then the red ball after one complete revolution or rather one complete trip on the strip it lands up in the uh, other side okay and this is called as a mobius strip as i said uh, there should be a, a an umlaut uh, that is there all right so uh, why am i saying this uh, is there a reason that i'm saying this or um, uh, is there a relationship this you can make it at your home in your leisure just with a paper uh, scissors and uh, glue and the reason that we are saying this is the following okay so uh, electrons have this property what do i mean by this okay i box this statement and let me try to explain that uh, why uh, electrons do have this property so what i mean is that the electronic wave function after a rotation of 2 pi which is a complete circle doesn't come back to the same point what it means is that uh, if you start from the uh, you know the trough of the wave function then after a 2 pi rotation you go to the uh, the topmost point of the wave function uh, and uh, you go one more time around it um, and then you can uh, you can get it at the same uh, you know uh, position that's the trough the next trough okay so uh, these uh, the topmost point and the trough are not are uh, they are uh, you know a different uh, in phase so um, this is called as a 4 pi rotation uh, as you see that the 2 pi rotation it does not bring back to the same point uh, ideally you would have thought every uh, point or every function uh, which has an exponential behavior like for example an exponential i theta this function comes back to uh, the same point if you take theta to theta plus 2 pi okay so these are same but it does not happen for the for this uh, electron and uh, let us see how uh, that happens so uh, let us see the um, angular momentum of the electrons so how do we write the angular momentum operator let me write a jz for that i am taking the z component of the angular momentum and this is like a minus i h cross uh, del del phi okay precisely the l z has this form so i'm just using the total angular momentum operator okay so uh, now if you uh, if you operate this j z uh, on a wave function uh, it gives you a m h cross psi okay and uh, psi actually transforms as um, uh, so, if you put it uh, into the Schrodinger equation that is if you are trying to sort of you know find that this is del del phi of, of psi and this is equal to you know uh, m h cross psi okay and the solution would tell you that this psi uh, of uh, phi this is equal to e to the power i m phi psi of uh, phi okay so this is like psi of phi so this is like transforms in this particular fashion is what i mean to see say now electrons uh, by virtue of the fact that they are spin half objects or they have the uh, let's say the total angular momentum m uh, is equal to half okay now if you are finding it difficult you can write an lz only lz that will be uh, in in the sense that uh, you have to when we talk about m uh, then we are talking about the spin of the electron or the uh, you know the this quantum number m so uh, this tells you that it's a it transforms as exponential i phi by 2 psi 
okay. So, that means that uh, when you take phi to uh, uh, phi plus 2 pi, uh, then psi does not return back. to the same point. Now, what I when I say point, I actually mean that it uh, the same configuration. Okay. So, if psi will return back because of this factor which is uh, exponential i phi by 2 because is m is equal to half and uh, so phi equal to 2 pi will make it uh, you know uh, this is equal to uh, for 2 pi this will be equal to i pi and exponential i pi is equal to minus 1 and uh, this is really related to the antisymmetric property of the wave function that is when you swap two of them uh, then so this is what happens you know uh, so it, it picks up a minus 1 and the wave function really picks up a minus 1 when you swap two particles. Now this is a little subtle uh, this happens in three dimensions and um, if you want to do it in two dimensions which many of the things uh, or other systems that we will study um, in condensed matter physics is the uh, two dimensional uh, things such as uh, graphene or 2D electron gas. Um, this exchange is a little tricky and uh, there are braids that form which I do not want to go uh, at this point here. So, psi uh, returns back to the same point after 2 into 2 pi which is 4 pi which is nothing but 720 degree rotation ok. And uh, I sort of did that right after when we talk about the Mobius strips it is um, equivalent to the ant which had to go through two trips on the surface of the Mobius strip in order to come back to the same surface or the same point. Okay. So, this is analogous to that and uh, we are trying to you know bring in um, these connections of these topology and then uh, to various systems in, um, in, in physics, in quantum physics and then hence of course, we will go to condensed matter physics. Okay. So, in order to understand how this connection to condensed matter physics comes, a very large uh, contribution has been made by Michael Berry in the late 80s um, of the last century, uh, you know, or you know, something around the end of the towards the end of this uh, the last century uh, through various works, and uh, uh, we come across a number of quantities um, which uh, are named after him. Uh, and these quantities are very relevant for condensed matter systems and particularly for understanding the relevance of uh, topology and condensed matter physics. So, these are uh, Berry phase, uh, Berry um, connection, uh, Berry uh, curvature, and finally, a topological invariant which goes uh, in the name of uh, churn number or one can call it a TK and an invariant, we will uh, talk about that. Okay. So, we will talk about Berry phase with some details uh, and uh, just how a quantum mechanical system picks up a Berry phase. Um, in fact, uh, you can read up the parallel transport of a vector, um, it picks up an irreducible phase. Uh, and uh, so on. Uh, this Berry connection is um, analogous to what is uh, the vector potential in electrodynamics. Uh, the Berry curvature is analogous to the magnetic field as well as it is uh, analogous to the uh, this uh, or the radii of curvature or the radius of curvature. So, this is uh, the radius of curvature. Uh, so, this radius of curvature is uh, will behave uh, similar to the the Berry curvature, we will talk about that. And um, uh, this churn number again, let us go back to that same expression and see this, this will act as a churn number. 
as you see that 2 pi is of course a constant and for a given system if you do not uh, sort of you know puncture it or tear it uh, the genus will remain same is what we have said. So, the whole thing is a constant and this constant is the topological invariant of the system and which is analogous to the churn number that we will see ok and it has a very nice connection with the quantum hall effect all right. So, let me uh, see that how the connection comes about with all these armed with all these you know quantities such as berry phase, berry connection, berry curvature and churn number ok. So, uh, I just repeat uh, what has been said that the Gaussian curvature is analogous to the berry curvature in condensed matter physics, the surface area this is something very important that what is the surface area that you talk about here. This surface area in condensed matter physics is nothing but the Brillouin zone ok and you know that um, in uh, solid state physics or uh, condensed matter physics the first Brillouin zone uh, is the most important thing. Uh, if uh, anything is going or any vector wave vector is going beyond uh, the uh, first Brillouin zone it can always be brought back to the first Brillouin zone by adding or subtracting some uh, reciprocal lattice vector. So, that is the area that we are talking about here we are talking about the surface area in condensed matter physics we will be talking about the Brillouin zone ok. Um, the vector potential as I said is, um, is the Berry connection analogous to the Berry connection the genus uh, is the topological invariant which can be churn number or uh, some other invariant uh, according to the classification of topological insulators. So, uh, the line integral of the Berry connection is uh, called as the uh, Berry phase uh, we will uh, sort of write that in a moment and the surface integral of the Berry curvature is called as a churn number which is analogous to the Gauss bonnet theorem ok. So, we uh, integrate the Berry curvature over the Brillouin zone we get a, a topological invariant which is uh, let us say it is a churn number for a time reversal symmetry broken system and um, uh, for the Gaussian uh, curvature you get uh, sort of you when you uh, sum it over or the integrate it over the uh, entire surface area of the object you get. Um, um, an invariant which contains a genus ok or the point Poincare curvature ok. So, now very interestingly uh, this is uh, shown a priori, but then of course, we will uh, talk about this. Uh, so, you see a donut here uh, on the left and then there are specs and so on and on the right what you see is the integer quantum hall effect graph ok, where uh, you plot the uh, rho x x which is shown in this um, uh, I am not too sure whether you see it as uh, this maroon red kind of thing which are these ones. So, these plots are the, the longitudinal resistivity. Uh, so, just to tell you in a very brief a few words you have a magnetic field and you have a 2D electron gas ok. And uh, what you do is that you send a current in this longitudinal direction ok, because uh, so there is a there is a voltage here and you send a current and uh, there is a current that is moving which means the electrons are in motion and they are subjected to a perpendicular magnetic field. So, the low range force will come into picture and this low range force will make the charges the positive and the negative charges segregate at opposite ends of these transverse ends of these uh, um, of this sample. I am not that careful about uh, you know uh, the, the accumulation of charges I mean they could be the, the positive could be on the lower half and the negative could be on the other upper half, but what is important is that uh, that you can uh, figure out from the direction of this E and, and the B uh, and the motion of the charges. So, what is important is that there is a, a voltage that develops because of the accumulation of these charges and so on. We will uh, tell you uh, in details about that. So, if you calculate the voltage in the transverse uh, direction. So, there is a voltmeter you will uh, register a voltage because the charges have segregated and this happens in equilibrium and uh, so this was uh, originally uh, discovered by Edwin Hall in 1879 and which goes by the name Hall effect and uh, that really is uh, this part of the plot. 
uh, where you see the Hall uh, resistance which is uh, linear uh, here and uh, of course, uh, you can measure the uh, this uh, magneto resistance that is resistance uh, in the same direction as the flow of current which is almost like a constant. But uh, in those days, uh, the ability to actually access very large magnetic field um, was not there. Uh, so, you do not uh, you, at, uh, in those days you did not have very large electromagnets which can produce very large fields. About 100 years later in 1879, um, so this was by uh, K. Uh, von uh, Klitzing who was studying the mobility of the uh, MOSFETs. In fact, they were trying to improve the mobility of the MOSFETs, uh, you know, which are semiconductors with uh, applications and so on. And he found that uh, when he goes to very large uh, values of fields, these magnetic field being uh, to 15 Tesla, 15 Tesla by the way is a very large field. Um, of course, in those days, uh, it is extremely large and you need to have very large magnetic field facility in order to access this. Um, he found that the, the hall uh, which is uh, shown on the right hand side of this uh, plot which are shown by these things, uh, these plateau structures, he noticed that the hall resistivity is quantized in unit of h over e square. Okay? So, uh, this was like h over e square this was h over 2 e square, this was h over 3 e square and so on so forth okay? and h over 4 e square and so on. So, this uh, quantization of the Hall resistance was uh, not known earlier and then it was found that these plateaus are extremely robust and they are accurate up to 10 to the power minus 8 or 10 to the power minus 9. And uh, they do not go away with uh, increasing the magnetic field and the disorder in the system. And these are uh, just the 2D electron gas that is uh, the electrons are being confined in a two dimension and the magnetic field is in the z direction. So, this was a uh, sort of discovery uh, which um, you know went ahead. Uh, to uh, sort of this uh, forms this uh, this called as the metrology where uh, this h over e square is approximately uh, 25.8 kilo ohms. So, that is uh, uh, the benchmark of resistance which is fixed from an experiment macroscopic experiment on really dirty systems. Dirty means there are a lot of disorder and defects in the system. And uh, it still was able to give you uh, these value of this resistance uh, in terms of the uh, you know microscopic parameters H is a Planck's constant and E is the electronic charge. So, H over E square uh, is what you see here. Uh, so, this uh, helped us to you know benchmark the value of resistance and h over e square uh, you know is actually 25.8 kilo ohms. So, if you want to know what is the value of 1 ohm which is uh, h over e square divided by 25.8 kilo ohms would be the value of 1 resistance um, I mean 1 ohm of resistance. Okay. So, uh, this was a, a big discovery and um, it was uh, awarded this uh, Klitzing um, was awarded Nobel Prize after that and um, this was actually uh, the samples were obtained from two uh, engineers called Dorda and Pepper. And uh, if you want to know that uh, uh, why are these two figures that are existing on the left hand side to this uh, experiments on an electron uh, gas uh, in presence of a magnetic field and uh, then we will say that this hole this one hole this is linked to this and uh, these have two holes that are linked to this h over 2 e square and so on. So, if you find uh, an object with three um, holes uh, so that will correspond to the third plateau and and so on which means that uh, uh, these uh, are the topological invariants uh, uh, which are called as a churn number. So, so this can be written we will just uh, show in a while that this can be written as uh, the conductivity or the resistivity can be written in terms of uh, the churn number it is uh, e square over h and so on. Okay? We are talking about uh, here we are talking about 
resistivity, but we will uh, we can talk about conductivity because uh, conductivity is what is calculated using theoretically using Kubo formula. Okay. So, uh, let me uh, sort of give you a brief overview of the Berry phase which is what we have said um, and uh, we will um, it is just a quantum mechanical description it is uh, small, but it will help you understand that in a certain uh, cases um, the wave function picks up phases which are irreducible and they stay and uh, they act like an invariant to the system and these invariants um, aid us in understanding uh, the topological properties of the system. Okay. So, it is a general introduction to Berry phase. Okay, so, um, we know that if you have this uh, particle in a box which is the first problem of quantum mechanics that you do it is uh, between 0 to L or minus L by 2 to plus L by 2. So, there is a particle there uh, these uh, uh, are infinity. So, V is equal to 0 here and V is equal to infinity at uh, each of these things. So, the particle cannot escape the particle is confined in the within a length 0 to L and it is a uh, one dimensional problem and you solve uh, the one dimensional time independent Schrodinger equation uh, is equal to E psi and you, you know that this is uh, like the psi becomes equal to root 2 over L sin n by x by L. So, uh, this is solved by using the boundary condition that uh, psi at 0 is equal to psi at L and uh, this is good enough to characterize uh, the system or rather uh, to entirely uh, sort of um, uh, you know uh, set the boundary conditions for the system. And uh, in such a system because of this confinement uh, the k is quantized as or the wave vector is quantized as n pi over L. Okay. Uh, and uh, let me write down psi as psi n and I will write out down the energy as well which is n square pi square h cross square by 2 m l square okay, where m is the mass of the particle particle of mass m. Okay. And, uh, and now uh, of course, uh, if you try to solve any wave equation just like a normal wave equation uh, this is uh, different than that this uh, you get quantization. Okay. And this is not unknown even in uh, case of an organ pipe uh, the frequencies are quantized in terms of nu over uh, the fundamental frequency by 2 L or 4 L uh, depending on we have an open organ pipe or a closed organ pipe. So, um, the quantization is not very specific to quantum mechanics, but what is important to uh, understand for us is that uh, the quantization brings in. Um, a scale of h uh, as you see a h cross here uh, this h uh, which has a value uh, h cross has a value some one point something uh, not too sure about uh, uh, what, what comes after decimal, but that you can check it is a one point uh, something into 10 to the power minus 34 joule second uh, it has the um, dimension of the angular momentum. and. Um, and this is clear from Bohr's postulate that uh, he said that uh, all these atoms and uh, they exist because uh, the electrons actually uh, revolve around the nucleus in certain uh, orbits stationary orbits he called them where uh, the angular momentum is uh, in terms of uh, is quantized in terms of um, nh or nh cross whatever. Okay. So, uh, that is uh, important in the sense that uh, h cross is the scale of quantities that we uh, find out here of course, e is in terms of h cross square and so on. Okay. Now, we want to understand that if adiabatically that is you know slowly uh, we change l in time that is we make l as a function of time and slowly change it and uh, in addition assume that the particle is in the ground state. So, uh, if this change is slow that is if the uh, width of the box or the, uh, you know the length of the box is being increased 
quasi statically or uh, it's such that the equilibrium is um, um, established at all uh, times, uh, then the particle should be in the ground state even at time t. Okay. So, uh, so what I mean to say is that for this box uh, wave function, the ground state wave function has nodes at both the ends is like this. Uh, in when you know uh, in this box also you will have the wave function which will have nodes ok. So, this is uh, 0 to L and 0 to L uh, at a time t. So, this is L at 0 ok. So, it is uh, expected that uh, this is what will happen. Now, assume that uh, H is some function of lambda some parameter lambda we are not specifying what uh, parameter that is, but um, these lambdas are explicit functions of time. So, h is uh, implicitly h depends on time through this lambda and this lambda is a parameter that changes slowly. So, uh, the understanding is from the problem that we have stated before is that if uh, a, a system is in the nth eigenstate of h lambda 0, it will continue to be in the nth eigenstate. particular eigenstate what I mean by nth eigenstate is a particular eigenstate in h lambda of t ok. If this uh, parameter uh, changes very slowly which means that the system is never out of equilibrium and stays in equilibrium ok. So, um, the more important question that arises here is that what happens to the wave function ok and the wave function can be written as this is from our experience that uh, it picks up a phase of course, with uh, psi at 0 uh, we will write that in terms of the basis functions. This is minus i by h cross and um, so, this is like E n uh, t prime uh, and a d t prime and a phi n of t ok, where of course, the phi n's are the basis sets. So, you have uh, h of t and phi n of t uh, this is equal to epsilon n we are saying that a, the dependence is through lambda. So, this is E n of t uh, phi n of t ok. So, this problem is known that is h acting on the basis sets will uh, give rise to the energies of course. And uh, this of course, is true if h does not depend upon time which we know that the phase actually comes out as a uh, uh, exponential uh, i e t by h cross or minus i e t by h cross. So, independent of time means it does not vary with time ok. But um, of course, uh, for time dependent problems it uh, cannot be done that is uh, we cannot uh, say this uh, we will see how. Uh, so, in that case you have um, we need a little adjustment and the adjustment is done through a coefficient which depends explicitly on time and then exponential minus i by h cross uh, some 0 to t say for example, and epsilon n t prime d t prime and a phi n of t ok. So, um, I mean as I said that this equation let us say uh, this equation this ansatz would definitely be correct if h is not a function of time that is h does not evolve with time. But suppose it does which is the case that is going to be uh, you know considered by us here 
um, we need a little adjustment uh, in that uh, we add these coefficient which depends on time. So, we have written down the same thing excepting um, multiplying this uh, by this quantity, so the coefficient. Okay. And of course, if you see that if you write this as 3, uh, I mean um, the 3 and 1 would agree if c of t is equal to 1. All right. So, uh, now what we do is that we put this into the Schrodinger equation and the Schrodinger equation is we write down the time dependent Schrodinger equation here uh, because we need to uh, we have uh, time dependence in h and this is i uh, h cross del del t minus h. I am just writing both of them together psi of t has to be equal to 0. Uh, that is the equation and uh, the solution of this I am just directly writing down the solution, but you can put uh, the psi of t what I have written uh, in equation 3 and then do a little bit of simplification and uh, you would get this um, the equation of motion. Uh, this will be or rather this is the equation according to which there is nothing but the Schrodinger equation written again in terms of the coefficient. So, this c dot t this is equal to uh, minus c of t um, and uh, you have a phi n of t and you have a d d t I am writing it uh, a full derivative as uh, you know uh, in, in equation 4 we have written a del del t, but it is same here it is a d d t of this and uh, so this will be the solution of this equation and um, uh, or rather this is the Schrodinger equation. So, 4 and 5. So, uh, putting 3 in 4 we get 5 okay. and uh, so this is uh, uh, the equation of motion uh, for C uh, the solution is obtained as. So, C of t equal to C of 0 uh, exponential uh, minus i uh, minus this is exponential 0 to t uh, phi n t prime uh, d d t prime. I am just using a dummy variable so that I can write down the limits uh, from 0 to t uh, phi n of t prime and d t prime. Okay. So, that is the equation or rather that is a solution let us write it as 6. Uh, let us call this as um, let us call this as i gamma in the sense that uh, we will write it as c 0 uh, exponential um, i gamma where gamma is equal to i I am uh, absorbing uh, the i in gamma. Uh, so, this is equal to uh, 0 to t and a phi n uh, t prime the simple algebra I am doing. So, d d t prime uh, and a phi n t prime. Okay. So, uh, this is c of t and this is the solution of this equation in, in case of a time varying uh, Hamiltonian. So, this is let us call this as 7 okay. and uh, the gamma is this and uh, we can call this as 8 and we can call this as 7. Okay. This extra phase that comes, so gamma is called as a Berry phase and this Berry phase is irreducible. It is an irreducible and it is unlike the uh, dynamical phase. Okay. The dynamical phase does not appear dynamical phase what I mean to say is that exponential i omega t or i e t by h cross and so on uh, or minus i e t by h cross. The wave function having that kind of time dependence is not concerning for the reason that uh, 
whenever we are trying to calculate the expectation values of uh, observables or operators or uh, we talk about physical observables or we talk about probability density, um, uh, these uh, sort of do not appear because they cancel out, the phases cancel out. However, this phase will not cancel out and we will see how. Uh, so, uh, we ask this question that uh, can we in the definition uh, of uh, these eigenstates, can we absorb the phase and uh, this is what is done. So, we can probably absorb this phase also, but it will still give rise to measurable consequences. Say we uh, explore whether basis cats can absorb this phase. Okay. And uh, if it can be done, so let me uh, redefine the basis case as uh, phi prime n, uh, this is equal to I take this chi of t which is uh, what which I have defined as a Berry phase n equal to phi n of t. Okay. So, I redefined it so that I it can be absorbed. Okay. Um, so, uh, if you do that then I phi n uh, prime uh, t uh, d d t prime which is there inside the phase which is in the definition of gamma uh, that can be so let us uh, what numbers are so 8 and let us call this as 9. Uh, so, phi n prime t uh, this is equal to I mean i uh, phi n of t d d t and a phi n of t till this point it is fine, uh, this looked like the same, but there is a minus d chi d t because uh, chi now depends upon time. This is new and was not there, so let us call this as equation 10. Okay? So, this uh, is the, even if you do this try to uh, modify or uh, renormalize your basis, then also you, you are left with a d chi d t term which uh, cannot be um, ignored uh, because chi is a function of time. And in order to understand that what is d chi d t or how this gives rise to measurable consequences, uh, let us have a Hamiltonian which um, is uh, like this. So, consider the time dependence of the Hamiltonian. as h of uh, uh, t equal to t, uh, this is same as the Hamiltonian at h equal to t equal to 0. Okay? So, the Hamiltonian is periodic uh, in uh, with a period capital T. Okay? So, this is a particular case, but it will uh, sort of can be uh, done for any arbitrary dependence. So, we uh, get this from equation, so let us call this as 11 and so from 10 what we get is the following. We get um, i and uh, so this is over the entire cycle, so we uh, sort of you know uh, take this phi n uh, prime t. Uh, d d t of uh, phi n prime t, this is equal to i uh, this and a phi uh, n of t uh, d d t of uh, phi n of t uh, and uh, you have uh, there is a d t of course there, uh, there is a d t which I forgot here. And then there is a term which is a minus chi um, at t equal to t uh, minus a chi at t equal to 0. Okay? So, as I said this is let us define equation 12 and this is uh, irreducible and this is the very phase. So, even if the Hamiltonian is exactly same, the phase that it picks up over a full cycle from uh, 0 to t 
uh, they are not same and they do not cancel out and this contribution stays and we will see that uh, this is exactly you know we will uh, write down this in terms of the Berry connection and uh, can be uh, the Berry connection can be related to the Berry curvature and integrating the Berry curvature over the Brill 1 zone will give rise to the churn number. We will stop here and um, uh, carry on from here in, in the next lecture and uh, this is just to give you um, an idea of the Berry phase that in a, a slowly varying time dependent Hamiltonian gives rise to observable consequences. It picks up an additional phase uh, and the phase cannot be reduced and uh, this phase bears the testimony if it is uh, finite that is if you take um, uh, say an electron over a closed path uh, and take it uh, you know a 2 pi rotation if uh, this uh, does not give rise to uh, a 0 uh, you know observable effect on its wave function or on the observable properties or uh, consequences that are uh, important you know uh, on its physical properties then we say that the it has non trivial uh, properties okay the electron or the system has non trivial properties and this non triviality is related to the topological properties as we shall see okay uh, thanks for your attention mm -hmm.